and we'll uh, you know, try to get you to lunch shortly after this, right, I think is the, what's up next. So I'll talk a little bit first about Talk a little bit about uh, the pre-digital days of Topps. So, uh, a lot of people don't know Topps is actually a 77-year-old company. Uh, it was founded in 1938 as, as a chewing gum company. So it sold a little chewing gum at the at the checkout, at the five and dime, and actually invented the modern baseball card to sell more gum. So, I don't know if you bought baseball cards. Who? A quick show of hands. Who in their childhood has had baseball cards, football cards, soccer cards? Good, excellent, excellent. Um, and you remember the pink gum that tasted lousy and broke into a million pieces. Um, we do have the digital gum, and I'll have a screenshot of that for you as well. But, um, you know, it really took off kind of in the 60s, 70s, heyday of the 80s in, in the physical card business and in, into the 90s. There was a little bit of a, a boom into a bust scenario in the physical business. Um, but it settled into a very nice business for the company, and Topps is, has become a big company around physical cards and candy and confections. We make things like ring pop and push pop and all those as well. Um, so when you know, they had the foresight to start a digital division four years ago um, under Michael Eisner's guidance, who was a former CEO of Disney, um, probably didn't fit within their current portfolio. And the, the people that they had kind of starting that division had, had the foresight to, to kind of go to mobile and start a mobile first, which was a, a great skip. Um, and really set us up and set you know, me up for some success as I joined the company earlier this year. Um, you know, when, when I you know, asked for kind of a show of hands, you know, these are probably the images that you were thinking about in your baseball card collection or in your bike spokes or maybe trading with your friends or the, the famous one on the lower right. That is my quote as well. My mother threw mine away. I, I'm sure I had thousands of dollars worth of baseball cards thrown away. But this is what we're at today. And, and it means something very, very different to both our existing audience and to a new audience who doesn't necessarily view a baseball card or a football card or a soccer card or a Star Wars card in the way that, that we did growing up. And these are, you know, much like you consume media in a digital way for television, for music, for movies, trading cards are following that trend. And so we currently have the four apps, three sports, which make, make a lot of sense in line with our physical business. Star Wars was a, a new venture for us this year and has been wildly successful as, the, as we're building up to the, the new movie coming out in December. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of what we did and, and how we did to kind of get to where we are today. So the first thing is, you know, digital trading cards was kind of new. And I still talk to people who go, well, what's a digital trading card? Why are you paying for a screenshot? And there was a, an article online a couple of weeks ago that said, you know, this screenshot of Han Solo is worth $225, and it was, a, it was, I'll show you the picture later, but it was a long, very detailed article. They interviewed everybody on our team, they interviewed our licensor partners, they interviewed collectors, and they couldn't get over the fact that people were buying and selling digital cards. And that is kind of the biggest barrier for us, is kind of once people kind of get over that, that step in their head, they get into it. And it is much the collector mentality, opening packs, finding rare treasures, and trading it with your friends and then playing along with, with different ways to play in the app once you get in there. And we sit in this interesting space in between kind of physical trading cards with, you know, the tops business in our own right, but also, you know, companies like Panini and Upper Deck and video games as well. So we sit in this kind of interesting space, which has been great for us because generally it means those rights have been available for us when we went out to, to talk to our partners, which is great. Um, and I think we, you know, what we needed to do for our customers, so we needed to define that space for our licensing partners, but for our customers, we needed to, to help them get over that, that, that hurdle and give them kind of the idea that we're going to be around. And so the fact that Topps is a 77-year-old company, we've leaned very heavily into the Topps brand, that we're not going anywhere anytime soon, and these digital cards do have lasting value. So it's worked reasonably well, right? We've, we've kind of carved out this niche. We've stayed away from the gaming category on your, your mobile devices, which is you know, 80, 90% of the, the business is done in the games category. It's a very highly trafficked, trafficked um, category, very difficult to kind of stand out. So we're standing out in the sports category. We're standing out in the entertainment category. And you can see from some of the, you know, kind of the app Annie ranking numbers, you will see that the, you know, we're seeing success on all of our apps. And, you know, competing with kind of the big boys in, in the gaming and entertainment space, which is great. Um, seeing some really nice traction there. 
So what is it? What, you know, the, the, the core of it is you are opening packs of cards and kind of lean into what you know. And there's the, this is a uh, animation sequence from our Bunt app. And if you can imagine this, I encourage you, please download the apps and, and tell your friends. But you know, open the pack of cards. You will tap on the card to open it up. You get a, a variety of different opening animations, whether it's a wax pack or a foil pack, or all of those things are kind of replicated. You get that digital gum, it actually breaks into a billion pieces. Um, and then you thumb through your cards. And as you find a rare or interesting card, or a, a card of a, a team that you're a fan of, your phone's going to vibrate and it plays animation and does all sorts of cool things to let you know that you've got something cool there. So this was great. This was a great foundation for us. We've kind of leaned into to kind of something that makes sense and is familiar. But then, you know, how did we go from there? Um, the original version of, of Bunt, which was our first app out, had room for nine cards in the collection. And we, it was done because we wanted to stimulate trading. We wanted people to kind of trade the, the players back and forth and trade the cards back and forth. Well, that's not how collecting works. Collectors usually don't stop at nine cards. And so what we, we did instantly was to kind of remove that, that limitation. And we saw our business take off from there. Um, and that was great. We had a nice audience starting to build traffic, starting to build user base. But we weren't making a lot of money yet. So we, you know, we were doing well on kind of what we call base pack sales, which are, you know, it was a reasonable business. And then we said, well, you know, what people really chase in the collector scene are these inserts, and whether the inserts are rare cards, specially designed cards, signatures, relics, those types of things. We started putting those types of things into our apps in very rare quantities, and our revenue took off. Our revenue started to skyrocket. So between the, the collection size and the rarity and the scarcity of, of inserts, we started to see a very, very real business here, and we've expanded into football, into soccer, into Star Wars. So, the difference between the physical and the digital world is digital is always live, right? 24-7, 365. We're putting out new content multiple times a day in each of our apps. So our staff is actually a staff of live producers and live operations producers and artists who put out a tremendous volume of cards. And the, so far, the, the public consumption rates have been very, very good. The, 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 you know, the appetite hasn't been satiated yet, which is great. Um, and you see these types of cards down on the, on the screen here, these are cards that exist only in the digital form. Right? We, we put out probably 10 times the amount of digital cards as we do on the physical side. And it, you can only get them for now in the digital space. And so those were great kind of core experiences for, for tops, kind of opening packs, finding inserts, building your collection. And then so what was next? Um, our customers really were the ones who kind of guided us along what was next into the apps and what made the apps they are today by telling us, you know, they wanted that trading platform. So we have, we essentially have the eBay trading platform of digital trading cards in our app. You can go into the app, you can search everybody that's in the app, what cards they have, what cards they need, and you can find the perfect trading partner worldwide instantly at any time of day. So if I open up my, my apps, I'm going to have trade, uh, trade offers waiting for me. Um, some of them are very good, some of them are very poor, and we give you kind of that eBay rating system of one to five stars so that you can rate your trading partners, which is, which is uh, working out very well for us. In, I have to update this, the stat, we're actually fielding over a million and a half trades per day now um, between the four apps, which is just a, a tremendous volume of cards flying back and forth. Um, there's an interesting opportunity here, and I'll close on that in a, in a few seconds. Um, the other part of it is a gameplay component and the ability to, to do something with your cards. You know, people wanted to, to, to play and interact with their cards. And so we have this, this concept of a, a fantasy-like experience in our, in our apps right now. So you, in baseball, you have nine spots. You can drag a card that you own into the lineup and you earn points for when they're playing. The, the, the interesting thing that we're doing is we're doing a live fantasy that is kind of minute to minute. So as Mike Trout, ends his at bat, let's say he hits a home run, um, you can take Mike Trout out of your lineup and then go put the next guy into, the, into your lineup and earn points for that. And you can do multiples of that. So if you have nine Mike Trouts, you could have done nine Mike Trouts in the lineup. So a little bit of an interesting take. And we're seeing baseball, um, we're seeing this led by uh, American football. About half of our user base uses this every Sunday and, and Monday night. 40% um, on soccer and about 30% on baseball which is a pretty nice uptick. Um, and then the last part for us is this concept of uh, off-season off play. So 
Uh, we knew that th those numbers would cap out at some point, and you need a live game to, to kind of tie it to. So we, we came up with a concept of a card battle mode where cards can kind of face off against each other at any time. And that was really the basis for Star Wars as a concept and, and really led to some interesting things there as well. And two last things that are pretty unique, but you know, that really want to point out that, to, that are part of this digital business is we have the physical business is a tremendous advantage for us. So we've started doing this in uh, baseball first, but we're also doing it with soccer and Star Wars, and I think we're kicking off with the NFL in November, where in our physical products, we're giving you a chance to get exclusive digital content and unlock that through a physical code um, on a card. So we did it in two ways. We do a, a big mass advertising code so you get a chance to try the app and get free currency, which is great uh, for us on the digital side. And then we do a super rare physical insert that unlocks a digital component, uh, a matching card in the digital space, which these were trading on eBay for $100 if you used the digital code, $200 if you didn't use the digital code. So super rare and kind of driving uh, value on both the physical and the digital side. And then the last one for us is, you know, as that article on io9 mentioned, we're, we're seeing a very robust secondary market uh, develop around our digital cards, and, and really, we didn't expect this. So we're seeing, if you go to eBay right now and you search for Topps Bunt or Topps uh, St or Star Wars Card Trader or something like that, you'll see cards that are selling for $200, $300, $400, $500 a pop, and they're coming back, they're completing the sale in eBay, and they're completing the trade back in, into our app. Um, this is new for us, and it's, it's kind of something where our, our digital business is probably outpacing our legal team in terms of the, the idea of ownership of a digital card. And you know, we even got a call from eBay about, like, what is this? They, they didn't understand it. They didn't want to know what was going on. And so we have a, a team of people now that are like eBay verifiers. Um, so we can go in and, and kind of blacklist sellers if they're scammers, basically. Um, and it, it's something that eBay doesn't patrol on their own. They don't want to have a piece of that. So maybe this is something that there's potential for us in our future. So anyway, that's uh, the introduction to the tops in the digital business there. Does, um, does the collection live on someone's phone or is it on your server? So if someone takes a bath with their phone, is it gone forever? No, it's, it's stored on our servers. It's a, a client server architecture. So it, not only is it stored on your phone, but you can access it on multiple devices. So right now we're, we're iOS and Android devices, but if we were on you know, PlayStation and Xbox, you should be able to access your own collection anywhere. Does that damage sort of the perceived value if they don't really physically possess it? Well, they, I mean, they, there is, they really don't physically possess it. I mean, you're paying for bits at some level, um, but ultimately you do own the right to see those bits in your account. Like, you think, if you think about it as like a, you know, an iTunes account, it's, it's, it's very similar. Hi, uh, I actually have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is, uh, since you mentioned uh, EA up there, and uh, you know, they have a big business about people being able to open cards, has there been any interest in, uh, from their side or any other video gaming company <coughs> where, you know, uh, th where they want to integrate with you, uh, like if I, get a card here, uh, it shows up in my EA account, et cetera? We haven't talked to them. I actually worked at EA for 15 plus years, so I'm familiar with the ultimate team business is probably what you're referring to. Technically, those aren't trading cards, and they only have the right to use kind of headshots for players and, and certain things. They're, they're building teams. Uh, it's a distinction that our licensors and the leagues make, and our players maybe don't see that distinction just yet. Okay. Um, but we think our photography and our designs are far superior to that, but obviously EA has a simulation kind of gameplay component that we probably have no aspirations to attend. And, and the second part of the question was, so having worked at EA, you probably uh, are aware of how, you know, coins are sold off-site, et cetera, and uh, is that a problem that you've been seeing uh, where people might be selling credits off-site where you don't actually get a part of it? So, I mean, we, we made a mistake at EA in allowing a transferable economy, and I also worked at Zynga and Zynga Poker, which had a, a huge transferable economy, which, so if you go today and search Zynga Poker Chips on Google, all you'll find are sites that sell them on, the, on kind of the gray market. Um, we don't have a transferable economy in, in Tops right now, and I don't really have plans to do it because we can't, I think, kind of open up a Pandora box, there, Pandora's box there. So when I'm, I'm uh, uh, giving somebody an offer to get their card, I'm only allowed to give them cards in return, not Correct. Yeah, you uh, can't trade coins in our, in our app currently. Uh, okay. But I could uh, have a lower value card uh, being traded for a higher value card because they paid me or something like that. And that's that. what we're, we're seeing right now through the secondary market. That's exactly what 
people are doing is to, to get a $200 card, you have to trade something. And it, yeah, they're, they're inequitable trades. Um, I apologize if you answered this, but um, it's also another two-part question. One, um, what is the sort of age of the audience that you see that using this product? Um, and then, uh, well, I'll change that one first. <laughs> well, it, it's a complicated answer. And, and the reason it's complicated is because it goes from 13 to 65 plus, right? And so it starts at 13, though? It does start at 13 um, because we have an app purchase, and that, that's kind of the, the gate for coming in and, and doing an app purchase. 65% okay. of our audience on our sports apps is 13 to 25. So just to give you kind of a skew there, but is that it, skew older or younger? What, what do you mean? Like I mean, towards the 25 end or towards the 13 end? Yeah, I, I, I would say it's, yes, probably on the older end okay. of the, the 25 side, yes. Um, and then the sort of second part of my question is, do you see sort of these other trading card games that are un, unrelated to sports, so Magic, Pokemon, mm -hmm. all these other Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever else is out there, um, and they obviously have online systems that seem somewhat similar to this. Do you see those as competition or do you see as those as sort of separate markets that people like to play magic and people like to play sports and those are different and so that's okay. Well, I, I think there's overlap and, and I do think that we're in the same market, that kind of digital collectible card game market, um, but they're, they're very different. Like magic and, and Hearthstone and those types of games are really games first and collecting second. And right now we're collecting first and game second, but you know maybe there's an evolution on both sides that we kind of meet in the middle. I'd love to have the numbers that Hearthstone has. <laughs> Um, you, uh, you mentioned eBay Sorry, there before. Um, there's a lot of old Topps cards that are, sell, that are sold on eBay. Of Can course. you tap into that old market and do you guys you know, create digital copies of old cards now? It, it gets complicated on the rights side as to whether or not you have the player rights and the league rights in terms of you know, retired players and things of that nature. But yeah, we do a lot of, of, uh, you know, of those types of cards. They, they don't seem to, to, to draw in the digital space as much as they do in the physical space. Um, it becomes a rarity issue. The older it goes, I don't know if you guys know, but the, like the 56 um, Mickey Mantle, it's not even a rookie card, it's a second year card from Topps. The reason that's so valuable and it just sold for $450,000 recently is because 90% of them are sitting at the bottom of the ocean. Um, Topps way overproduced that year's set and there was no demand and they trashed them and they went on a trash barge and the trash barge got, got sunk. Um, so it's you know kind of at the East River opening into the, the ocean there. Um, and there's just very few of them. So it, it's the same thing in the digital space. We, we actually, we never violate kind of a, a covenant that we have with our players. If we're gonna say we release 100 cards of something, we never release 101st card. So we, we try to have that same kind of scarcity. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of paint the picture of the physical card. I, I mean, I collected back in like the mid 90s and I kind of think well, it was probably the heyday because all my friends did. And I was wondering what's been that trajectory of sales? Like have those depleted? Also, if you could just tell me, has this sort of digital card, has that cannibalized the physical card sales in any way or has it just been like a separate sort of luck graph, would you say? Well, I'm not an expert on the physical card market, but my understanding is that it's been pretty consistent after kind of that initial pop in, in, in that market. So, um, you know, the, our TOPS team does an incredible job to, to grow each of their businesses each year, but they, they have to work very, very hard to do it. It's not as easy to go out and get customers and shelf space and getting kids to kind of buy something physical is, is a real challenge. Um, but in terms of the overlap, we're seeing almost two distinctive audiences for the most part. And we're trying to do some of those integration pieces between the physical and digital space to, to have kind of that over, overlapping customer who buys both. Uh, right now, it's probably single digit percentage of, of the physical audience. All right, we've probably got time for one more quick question. Um, are you doing anything, and I apologize if I missed this, with the idea of sponsorable cards, sponsorable exclusive uh, releases of certain items, or does that cause conflicts with licensing agreements? It does cause conflicts with licensing agreements, so, but we do, we have done some things with league partners, for example, you know, Gatorade, Wilson, th those types of partners. So there are, are those opportunities, absolutely. And not directly sold by you, so the league sold? No, no, we sell them, and, and, and it becomes more of an advertising type piece. So, great. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.